Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series, and this is the last in that series, is on the book of Psalms. This is lesson number 13 from March 30 of 2024, entitled, Wait on the Lord. Do we really want to wait? Hmm. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, if there was any run who would be safe to wait on, it would be you. We know that you have promised and thousands of years have gone by and various things have happened and finally you always come through. Um, we trust that you will soon come again. May that day be soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have been studying the book of Psalms. What have we learned about the book of Psalms and about God during this series of lessons? I found it quite interesting myself, uh, some interesting issues. We have reached the last week in this quarter of the Psalms, this quarter study of the Psalms. The spiritual journey has taken us through the experience of awe before the majestic creator, king, and judge, through the joys of divine deliverance, forgiveness, and salvation through the moments of surrender and grief and lament and through the glorious promises of God's everlasting presence and the anticipation of the unending universal worship of God. The journey continues, though, as we live in the hope of the Lord's coming when our longing for God will find its ultimate fulfillment. If there is a final word that we can draw from the Psalms, it should be, wait on the Lord. Waiting is hard. Waiting on the Lord is not an idle and desperate biding of one's time. Instead, waiting on the Lord is, to, is an act of, full of trust and faith, a trust and faith revealed in action. Waiting on the Lord transforms our gloomy evenings with the expectancy of the bright morning, as in Psalm 30 and Psalm 143. It strengthens our hearts with renewed hope and peace. It demotivates us to work harder, bringing in the sheaves of plentiful harvest from the Lord's mission fields. Psalm 126 and Matthew 9. Waiting on the Lord will never put us to shame, but will be richly rewarded because the Lord is faithful to all his promises. I don't even like to think about it, but what will we do if we all of a sudden discovered that he has no plans to come back? I, I feel sorry for people who are atheists and don't believe God is. I mean, what if they figure our sun will last another 30 billion years or something like this, and then the whole, our whole solar system will turn into an iceberg or something like that? Exciting news. I'm not going to be around that long, <laughs> unless there is an eternal life. And who is it that's making those predictions? You check and yeah. Check them out and you find out uh, from other things they say it doesn't make sense. So why should they make sense about that? Okay, Jim. Psalm 30. Can you tell you that? Psalm 30, verse 5. His anger lasts only a moment. His goodness for a lifetime. Tears may flow in the night, but joy comes to the morning. American Bible Society, good news Bible. Whoa. His anger lasts for only a moment? Hold on just a minute. Like you look at, find another translation. It might not even be that. <laughs> well, what do we know about God's anger or wrath? Remember that God's wrath, at least two translations I know have basically the same Let thing. Let go. Let you do what you will. That's yeah. freedom. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you can't handle freedom, God, look at Romans 1. That's our, one of our key yeah. texts is Romans 1. Remember that God's wrath is simply his sadly turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. And what does Romans 6 say about that? Sin pays its wage, yes. death. Not God. God doesn't, no. need to do, doesn't need to lift a finger. <laughs> we have seen in this series of lessons that taking the wicked to heaven, or even to admit Satan to heaven, would be supreme torture from them, for them. Uh, and for those of you who want to check those places out. It's uh, Great Controversy, page four, I'm sorry, 542, 543, and 670. Well, Psalm 143, verse eight, what does that say, Jennifer? 
Remind me each morning of your constant love, for I put my trust in you. My prayers go up to you. Show me the way I should go. From the Good News Bible. Okay. Can God be constantly loving from this verse and be angry at the same time? Don't everybody talk at once. We just talked about he's, his anger is short. That's nice. Well, the back, back to that uh, Psalms 30, verse 5, another it uh, comes from uh, the strong number H639, and it could be translated as his passion. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, heavy breathing. That's, that's because the Hebrew has a very limited vocabulary, so it's... But, but unfortunately, many translations tr translated as God's anger, yeah. and it, rather than his... Yeah. yeah, and I don't see God as an angry... No. He, disappointed. Well, but and, is it, even is he disappointed if he's infinite and he knows the future, it's not coming as a surprise to him. It's not an emergency in the, in the universe. Yeah. Am I right? Correct, but it, it, but you still have the emotion. We're, if you've had kids, you can understand it a whole lot easier yeah. than a person <laughs> that has never had kids. Yeah. God is be desperately waiting for us to do what he has asked us to do so that he can come back. It might seem like we are waiting for him, but in actual fact, he's waiting for us. And I recently had the privilege of listening to a whole sermon showing how from the beginning, you know, all the way from Abraham's day, God is waiting and waiting. And, he, you know, and every, every time he, he told them exactly what he wanted them to do, they didn't do it, told them to do, didn't do it, told them what to do. Finally, he said, well, let me give you an example. Here's Jesus. Yeah. Did we follow his example? No. <laughs> it, was, it was a very interesting sermon. And what are we supposed to do while we are waiting? God offers us a protection, care, and constant love. But we must learn to trust Him. Psalm 27, 14, a great big verse there for you, Gordon. Trust in the Lord. Have faith. Do not despair. Trust in the Lord. Good okay. news Bible. Now you can tell me, what is the difference between trust and faith? Same word. Same, Same Greek word. word. It would also probably be translated as persuasion, or in other words, learn to listen from the, the message of the Creator. One so of them, it's, it's the same word in Greek. How about Hebrew that Psalms is written in? Is it? Um, I would have to go back and check that, but I think so. One of the main theme words for this lesson is hope. Without hope, we would be in a serious trouble. However, we have a hope that is beyond belief. Jesus Christ is coming back again to correct all that is wrong. So, Myra, you get the special passage here. Yes, Romans 8, 18 to 25. I consider that we suffer at this time, that this present time cannot be compared with all the glory that is going to be revealed to us. All of creation waits with eager longing for God to reveal to to reveal his children. For creation was condemned to lose its purpose, not of its own will, but because God willed it to be so. Yet there was hope that creation itself would one day be set free from its slavery to, de to decay and would share the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that up to the present time, all creation groans with pain, like pain of childbirth. But it's not just creation alone that groans. We have the Spirit as the first of God's gift also grown within ourselves as we wait for God to make us His children and set the whole being free. For it was by hope that we were saved. If we see what we hope what we hope for, then it is not really hope. For which of us hopes for something we see? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait with patience. Good news Bible. Okay, and our Bible study guide commenting, perhaps one of the greatest stresses in life is the stress of waiting. No matter who we are, where we live, what our station in life is, we all at times must wait for things. And 
we here in America are so blessed because I can tell you about times when even to buy, I've been in places where even to buy gasoline, you could wait in line for hours. Or food, flour, wait in line for hours. From waiting in line in a store to waiting to hear a medical prognosis, we wait, which we don't always like doing, do we? What then about waiting for God? The notion of waiting in the, on the Lord is found not only in the Psalms, but abounds all through the Bible. The operative word in all of this is perseverance. That's a big long word. Is what does perseverance mean? To, per you to persevere, through. to continue, to... Yes, to continue to do it even though it's difficult, right? Is our supreme commitment of refusing to succumb to fear of disappointment that somehow God will not come through for us. God's devoted child waits, knowing with certainty that God is faithful and those who want to who wait on him can trust that if we leave our situation to him, we can be sure that he will work it out for our best, even if, the, if at, the, this, at the time we don't necessarily see it that way. And even Jesus struggled with that a few times. Uh, it, it's, it's not a, I mean, it's not a sin to struggle with waiting. Mm -hmm. Waiting on the Lord is more than just hanging, hanging on. It is a deep longing for God that is compared to intense thirst in a dry land. The psalmist waits on many blessings from God, but his yearning to be brought close to his God surpasses any other desire and need in life from our Bible study guide for Sunday. So, are we really indeed waiting with earnest longing for the coming of the Lord? Or do we, silent, we sort of subconsciously hope that we're having a good time, Lord, just delay a little bit. I mean, isn't that the message of a lot of people in the world? I remember thinking that as, as a preteen teenager. Yeah. Wait just a little bit. Let me get married. Let me have yeah. children. Let me have... Yeah. That's because you loved being a teenager so much, huh? Yeah, I hated being a teenager. <laughs> if you go back up to uh, that verse, uh, Psalms 24, seven, excuse me, 27, 14, uh, the King James says, wait instead of trust. Yeah, okay. So it, uh, and it's more in keeping with the title of the, the, wait. the, the yeah. study. So anyway, that's... Yeah, okay. Okay, now, uh, what has God asked us to do while we wait? We are to bear witness to the trust, love, and hope that we have in Him. Remember that if Christ does not intend to come back for us, there was no reason for Him to come the first time. Stop and think about the implications of that. If He doesn't plan to come back, there was no reason for Him to come the first time. Acts 1. What, what do you do with what, Acts 111? He says, uh, the same Jesus is going up, is coming back. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one well, he a book he of said lies. repeatedly that, that he's going to come back. I'm just saying, yeah, I mean, obviously. The, he's trying to run the logic uh, to yeah. the conclusion, yes, yeah, so I understand. Yeah. Acts 1, 4 to 8. And when they came together, this is talking about the disciples immediately after all that incredible weekend. And when they came together, he gave them this order, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift I told you about, the gift my father promised. John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And did any of them say, hold on, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean by that? Maybe they did, but it's not recorded. <laughs> it's not recorded. Um, there... Some people who've, and I've asked this same question myself, uh, this Pentecost experience was incredible. We're not talking about that right now, but think about them. They could speak any language, but the Holy Spirit came down on Cornelius and his family. He was a Roman centurion in the same way that he came down on the disciples at Pentecost. Was that the real Pentecost? Where, a Gentile experiences that experience? Even a Gentile who knew nothing about God? Well, he, he no, he, he, he was, he was he part was, of the synagogue, wasn't he? 
he was he he helped he he, he supported them and he was he was looking for God he, let's say he was pushing toward God well when the apostles met together with Jesus they asked him Lord will you at this time give the kingdom back to Israel oh give me a break <laughs> I mean, they, they, unfortunately, they had been told this story so many times since they were little children that Jesus said to them, the times and occasions are set by my Father's own authority and it is not for you to know when they will be. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I'm just reminded of a funny story I heard today a very wealthy man that some of you people would know him or know, know about him if I gave you his name. He said, there's just one thing I want to know, and that is, where am I going to die? Because I'm going to avoid that place as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, in this lesson, we will see some interesting ideas used to present the truth about our waiting and trusting in God. Jim, Psalm 131, 1 Psalm to 3. Psalm verses 1 to 3. Lord, I have given my, excuse me, I have given up my pride and turned away from my arrogance. I am not concerned with great matters or with subjects too difficult for me. Instead, I am content and at peace. As a child lies quietly in his mother's arms, so my heart is quiet within me. Israel, trust in the Lord now and forever. The good Okay. God is, a, God is asking us to practice love. Love is the essence of his kingdom while we are still on this earth and will be for eternity, I might add. Unfortunately, we are born selfish. This uh, has a tendency to cause us to become self-centered. All we want to think about is ourselves. We are blinded to the higher cause of love, which is the nature of God. Understanding God's love is a challenge. His love is a great mystery. Why does he love us so much? Why, why was he willing to come and die on our behalf? Modern science reaches deeper and deeper into the extremes of our world. It continues to learn how much there is that we are not able to actually know completely. Yeah, Jennifer? What does, that mean? What does it mean, die on our behalf? Who made that, who mixed that statement up? Well, or what does basically, it mean? basically what that, means in the biggest possible situation is if he didn't die we wouldn't we couldn't be saved that's what it means I mean, yeah he came to teach well um, but is it not, he, it, it, he's it, using all the all the all, everything he did the whole story is that it makes it possible well, we, if, if you saved. approach sin as a disease and what do you need if you have a disease and uh, you want to be well, you have to be healed. You have to go mm -hmm. through a healing process, yeah. and the healing process is education. So Jesus came as an educator, yeah. not as a penalty payer. And well, no, well, nobody said anything about penalty payer. Well, but this, this cross and the death of Jesus is the greatest, one of the greatest lessons that was ever given. Well, do we? Okay, you say he 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 died. It tells us, it shows us. You're not going to go to heaven if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you didn't do that? You couldn't go to heaven? Well, no, I didn't say that. What I did say was, and this is not me, this is a quote from Ellen White and from the Bible, is that he came to demonstrate the truth about sin. And it's supposed to teach us something about sin. I'm, I'm sin is deadly. I'm in harmony with that. That's, okay, well, that's, that's what he did. Okay, but I don't, but if, if he hadn't come, what do you, we've discussed that, what, 40, 30 or 40 years ago with, in Maxwell's class. We, we were, most of us were there, several of us were in, anyway. And what are you going to do with, uh, with uh, Moses, Enoch, and Elijah? If Jesus never, never died, uh, that, was, was his, his death, did, what impact did his die and ha have on, on, on them as far as their candidacy for heaven? Well, one of the, one of the ways to answer that is that Moses and Abraham and others actually saw the life of Jesus. We don't know how much, but it says, the Bible says, they saw it in their day. And Jesus said, Abraham saw my life. Well, you, you know that, John 5. So I think they knew a lot more than we think. But it, it, it's still the act, the act 
The physical. It's not a penalty paying. That's the well, important. Well, as long point. as we haven't got that, uh, I hope we can let it slide for a while. <laughs> okay. okay. Jennifer, modern science. Modern science has shown us that even the, quote, simplest things can be incredibly complicated and far beyond our understanding, at least for now. In fact, there's a great irony. The more we learn about the physical world, the greater the mysteries that appear before us. And that is certainly true. Wow. That if we trust in God, we can wait in patience for him to explain everything in the future. God does not try to take us away from whatever support we may feel in this world without offering us a much better support in terms of his kingdom. It is like a small child who is weaning from the mother's breast but learning how to eat solid food. Jennifer, you want to tell us all about that? <laughs> Jennifer is a pediatrician. So why has God waited 2,000 years and still has not come back? Well, let's see if we can get some ideas anyway. Gordon? The end of Hebrews 5 and start of Hebrews 6. There has been enough time for you to be teachers, yet you still need someone to teach you the first lessons of God's message. <clears throat> Instead of eating solid food, you still have to drink milk, figuratively, of course. Anyone who has to drink milk is still a child without any experience in the matter of right and wrong. Solid food, on the other hand, is for adults who through practice are able to distinguish between good and evil. Let us go forward then to mature teaching and leave behind us the first lessons of the Christian message. We should not lay again the foundation of turning away from useless works and believing in God, of the teaching of baptisms and laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. Let us go forward, and this is what we will do if God allows. So we're not just supposed to stay as children, we're supposed to grow up, huh? Okay. So are those things listed, are those the basic messages of Christianity? He seems to imply that, at least the beginning messages. But God does not want us to think that his plan of salvation is too complicated for even a small child to understand. So what did Jesus say? In Matthew 18, 3, Jesus said, I assure you that unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Good news Bible. But we just read that God wants us to grow up in Hebrews and Paul in Ephesians 4, 13 to 16 goes on. And so we shall all come together in that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children, carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ, who is the head. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. Okay, now the big question. In what ways are we to be as little children? And in what ways are we to grow up? We are to be open as children are to new ideas. Willing to learn. Willing, Willing to, learn. to learn. Teachable. Okay, I have said in the past, and I'm going to repeat it right now, what's the most important characteristic of a child? They can grow. grow. The capacity to grow. Uh, grow physically, mentally, socially, spiritually. I mean, think about that. If suddenly a child stops growing mentally, we panic, right? If he stops growing socially, we don't think that's a good thing. And, and we could go through the whole list. So, but if they stop growing spiritually... Some people think that's wonderful. Yeah. But it's not. No. The psalmist looked forward earnestly for a time when they would be taken back safely to Jerusalem. Think of God's miraculous deliverance of Israel from Egyptian slavery. Think of the other times when God helped them to regain their independence from nations which had conquered them. And remember, of course, that Babylonian captivity, Assyrian captivity, and Medo-Persian captivity in each case. God delivered them and returned them to their sovereignty. These deliverances by God certainly should give us reasons to hope. 
Many years after the Psalms were written, Isaiah talked about those nations that had conquered at least portions of Israel. Isaiah 29, 7 and 8. Then all the, I think that's mine, then all the armies of the nations attacked the city of God's altar. All the weapons and equipment, everything will vanish like a dream, like something imagined in the night. All the nations that assembled to attack Jerusalem will be like a starving person. I, I, this is an incredible metaphor. Like a starving person who dreams he's eating and wakes up hungry. Or like someone dying of thirst who dreams he's drinking and wakes up with a dry throat. Mm. Quite a picture. Does this have anything to do with the conflicts in the Middle East today? That's something to think about. So one of our challenges is to review and to review again what God has done in the past, to see what we can learn from those experiences. And those are recoveries should give us renewed hope. Through Moses, God had given them some powerful promises. And just look at these examples. Jim, I think we got Deuteronomy. Uh, chapter 11, verse 14. If you do, he will send rain on you excuse me, on your land when it is needed, in the autumn and in the spring, so that there will be corn, wine, and olive oil for you, Good News Bible. And then in Deuteronomy 28, 12, he will send rain in season from his rich storehouse in the sky and blessings, and bless all your work, so that you will lend to many nations, but you will not have to borrow from any, Good News Bible. Okay, one of the motifs that God has used to teach his children about the, necess the necessity of being patient is to think about the harvest. One has to cast his seed into the soil and wait and wait more for it to come up to, up to, come up to sprout and to yield its abundance. It is interesting to notice that God intended for the children of Israel to enter the land of Canaan and drive out some fearsome, fearsome enemies. And then he told them that they were to go three times a year to Jerusalem. In some cases, traveling from Galilee, the round trip would take about a month. Would it be safe for them to leave their homes and travel to Jerusalem, leaving everything in the hands of God until they returned? Who would be Is that presumptuous? What? Whose hands would be better to leave, to leave it in? Well, I mean, how many, people had, to, faith, huh? how many had, people had to stay home? Did everybody go to Jerusalem? We don't really know. Okay. Um, Ex Jennifer. Exodus 34, verses 22 to 26. Keep the harvest festival when you begin to harvest the first crop of your wheat, and keep the festival of shelters in the autumn when you gather your fruit. Three times a year, all your men must come to worship me, the Lord, the God of Israel. Excuse me just a moment. How many men? It says all. all. It says all of them. Go ahead. So the women can watch the, watch the home for it. I, I see, okay. No, I don't think that's the way it worked. After I have driven out the nations before you and extended your territory, no one will try to conquer your country during the three festivals. There's a promise right there. Do not offer bread made with yeast when you sacrifice an animal to me. Do not keep until the following morning any part of the animal killed at the Passover festival. Each year, bring to the house of the Lord the first corn that you harvest. Do not cook a young sheep or goat in its mother's milk, from the Good News Bible. Wow. That's an interesting ending to that passage. I will just touch on that very quickly. There is pretty good evidence now that we have done a lot, a lot of more archaeology that this was a custom of the fertility cult religions around in that area. And so God is specifically warning them, don't get involved in those businesses. Mm -hmm. Well, what would we do if we felt that God expected us to take up to a month, three times a year to travel to a certain place and celebrate what he has done or what he is doing now? Gordon, how would you do, on th do that? Three, three months of vacation every year. It would be tough to take, let me tell you. <laughs> would we trust God with our property even for a few days? 
or do we depend on all, all our security measures? I can tell you that when I was a child living in northern Idaho, the only time we would lock our house was when we were gone for at least a week or two weeks. The house was always open. We'd leave for a while. We never bothered it. I don't think we ever had a key to our house. <laughs> you don't think you even had a key? We had a key. Can you think of times in your own life when you saw unmistakable working by God to preserve your life and the lives of others? or help you in some other way. And there are long psalms here that are just wonderful. I wish we had time to read them. So, read Psalm 92 if you, if you have a few moments, but here's a comment about Psalm 92. From the Bible study guide, the praise of God for the great works of his hands and the Eden-like portrayal of the righteous clearly point to creation, the first aspect that the Sabbath commemorates. The psalm also magnifies the Lord for his victory over enemies as the God of justice, and so reinforces the second Sabbath theme, redemption from evil, Deuteronomy 5. Thus, Psalm 92 extols God for his past creation and present sustaining of the world, and it points to the end time hope in eternal divine peace and order. From the Bible study guide for Wednesday. So what we're starting to see here is a picture where they recognize that the, the, the yearly celebrations three times a year and the Sabbath, weekly Sabbath, et cetera, each one of this, these things had links to things that had happened to them in the past and reminded them of God's promises and his hopes for them. We live in a wicked world, places where there are thieves and murderers surrounding us. Even in this environment, can we trust God? I mean, you turn on the news in the morning and the first thing you hear is somebody's been killed. In ancient times, special individuals were set apart as priests or kings by the anointing of oil from a prominent leader, usually the high priest. In Ezekiel 20, we are told several times that God has given us the Sabbath as a special holy day for us to commemorate and remember all that he has done for us and all that he plans to do for us. Ezekiel, let me just read Ezekiel 20, 20. I think we have time to do that. Make the Sabbath a holy day so that it will be a sign of the covenant, that's the agreement that we made and will remind you that I am the Lord your God. So what's the purpose of the Sabbath? Remind us that we have this in agreement. Okay, compare Exodus 31, 13, which says more or less the same thing in Hebrews 4, 1 to 10, again. In Psalm 92, the psalmist repeats the trust and hope that he has in God who protects him under whatever circumstances. It is safe for him to go to sleep at night because he will wake up happy. Now, after you had spent your life killing literally hundreds of people with your hands, with your sword, with your spear, would you be inclined to think that God is protecting you somehow? In a number of different places in the Psalms, it suggests that the time of day which best represents the hope we have in God is the morning. In fact, the Psalmists tell us that joy comes in the morning. And there's a bunch of verses that say that. And even if you go over to the New Testament, 2 Peter 1.19 says, so we are even more confident of the message proclaimed by the prophets. You will do well to pay attention to it because it is like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the light of the morning star shines in your hearts. Sounds like a great thing, doesn't it? <clears throat> and Revelation 22, 16, of course, says that Jesus comes. The joy of the Lord is compared by the, to the dawning of the day Jesus is described as a bright morning star which interestingly enough in Latin means, is, what is the, what's the bright morning star called? Lucifer. Lucifer. So Lucifer, when he was back in heaven, had one of the names of? Jesus. God. That's very interesting, huh? Um, in this, okay, in the Psalms, hold on, my computer is misbehaving, and there we go. Jim, in this, I'm sorry, Myra, in, in the Psalms? From the Bible study guide, it says, in the Psalms, morning is typically a time of day when God's redemption is anticipated. 
morning reveals God's favor, which ends the long night of despair and trouble, Psalms 30, uh, 130. And in Psalms 143, God's deliverance will reverse the present darkness of death, 143 verse 3, into the, into the light of a new morning and from, the be, and from being in the pit, these are all from one, Psalms 143, to residing into the land of uprightness. Okay, so again, I wish we had time to read all of Psalm 143, but we don't. Clear that the psalmist felt that his only hope for protection was in the Lord. Do we feel that way today? Uh, if you remember the story, one time David was hiding in a cave, and what happened? Saul came in that cave, the one who was after him to kill him. Saul came in that cave, and David was able to, you know, steal some of his stuff while he was there. There's one very important moment in salvation history that is con connected with early morning. Mark 16, 1 through 8. After the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spi spices to go and anoint the body of Jesus. Very early on Sunday morning, at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On their way, they said to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And it was a huge stone, I'm sure. It, uh, it was a very large stone, the scripture says. Then they looked up and saw that the stone had already been rolled back. So they entered the tomb where they saw a young man sitting on the right, wearing a white robe, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's not here. He has been raised. <laughs> I don't, I, you know, I, I, excuse me, but I mean, they must have, their jaws must have dropped open that far. Huh? I mean, he, he had told them, but it just, I mean, what would you say if you had a very good friend that died and then all of a sudden found that person was alive again? Anyway. Look, here is the place where they put him. Now go and give this message to his disciples, including Peter. He's going to Galilee ahead of you. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and ran from the tomb, distressed and terrified. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now who you have... Would, who would believe them? Yeah. You know, they would think they were crazy. Do you think the heavenly host were anxiously, anxious to welcome Jesus back to heaven? Is that why we have the words very early on Sunday morning? <laughs> I think so. The fact that Jesus arose from the dead in his own power and went back to heaven a short time later is proof that God can do that for us. Okay? As the morning star announces the birth of a new day, so faith heralds the new reality of eternal life in God's children. 2 Peter 1.19 Jesus is called the bright and morning star, Revelation 20 to 16, whom we eagerly await to establish his kingdom in which there will be no more night, evil and death, Revelation 21, 1 to 8 and 25. In the end, more than anything else, this is what we are waiting for when we talk about waiting on the Lord. And surely the wait is worth it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we've already read 2 Peter 1:19. But so, so we're even more confident of the message proclaimed by the prophets. You will do well to pay attention to it because it's like a lamp shining in a dark place until, until the day dawns and the light of the morning star shines in your hearts. And Ellen White's comment, Jim? Uh, over the rent sepulcher of Joseph, Christ had proclaimed in triumph, I am the resurrection and the life. These words could be spoken only by the deity. From Desire of Ages 653 and 654. 753, 753. Excuse me, 753, I'm sorry. All creature, excuse me, all created beings live by the will and power of God. They Including are, the devil himself, by the way. Correct. They are dependent recipients of the life of God from the highest seraph to the humblest animate being. All are replenished by the source of life. Only he who is one with God could say, I have power to lay it my life down, lay down my life, and I have power to take it up again. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death 
Ellen White, Desire of Ages, six, page 685. Seven, seven eighty-five. Seven, I don't know what's <laughs> got a, <laughs> a problem with sixes and sevens. Six, yeah. Okay, Jennifer? From the Bible Study Guide, Death, it has been said, has been etched in our cells at birth. Though true, at least for us fallen beings, what has the resurrection of Jesus promised us about the tempora temporality of death? Why must we never forget just how temporal death is for us? Okay. So, Gordon, we're going to ask you to take the next one there. Next one from Bible Study Guide for Friday. The Psalms utter fervent appeals to wait on the Lord. Quote, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him, end quote. When waiting strikes us as burdensome, uncertain, and lonely, we should remember the disciples on the day of Jesus' ascension to heaven. Jesus was taken up to heaven before their eyes while they were left behind to wait for him to come back on some unknown future day. Who has ever experienced a more intense yearning to receive God's blessing now than the disciples on that day? They surely long, Lord, take us with you. Don't take us with you now. Right, <laughs> now. <laughs> Emphasis okay. on now. Yet, they were instructed to wait for the promise of the Lord and for Jesus' return. If we think that the disciples were filled with despair and disappointment, we will be surprised. They returned to Jerusalem and did exactly what Jesus told them. They waited for the gift of the Holy Spirit and then preached the gospel to the world with power. Yeah. And if you go there, and when Peter and John, <clears throat> John were arrested by the people in the Sanhedrin for raising that guy from, or healing that guy at the gate, <laughs> Peter, who had been so, you know, afraid and, and backward and so forth, said, <laughs> this, this Jesus whom you killed is the one who gave us the power, I mean, the, 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 the high priest must have been, at this point, with his mouth hanging over, hanging open. Try to imagine yourself with the 11 disciples standing on the Mount of Olives and watching Jesus ascend slowly to, removed, to be removed by a cloud of angels and taken up to heaven. And, you know, just imagine here, you're watching somebody, you just walked up here and all of a sudden they're going, Whoosh, and you say, hold on, how, how, how did he do that, right? How do you suppose it made them feel when two bright shining angels stood beside them and said, look, be assured that Jesus will come again just as you have seen him go into heaven. Some people have questioned how we are to distinguish the true second coming of Jesus from those false messiahs and false Christ, read about it in Matthew 24, that we are told will come before him. The answer really is not very complicated. When the true Jesus shows up, all we have to do is look up the entire heavens will be filled with bright, shining angels, and Satan will never be allowed to duplicate Christ's coming. From Steps to Christ, page 75, it says, Then, if Christ is dwelling in our hearts, he will work in us both to will, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Uh, Philippians 2, verse 13. We shall work as He worked. We shall manifest the same Spirit, and thus, loving Him and abiding in Him, we shall grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, Ephesians 4, 13, uh, 15. Think of the, all the great heroes of faith who had to wait for long periods of time before they could receive what they were waiting for. Can you immediately think of an example? Sarah and Abraham, sure. Think about Abraham and Sarah waiting for a baby until they were far past the time when babies could have been born to them by all the natural means that we know about. He, Abraham was given that promise when he was 75. And how old is he when his baby, when his baby was born? 100. Wow. 25 years they waited. It's a long time. Moses waited for 80 years before God finally gave him his work of leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. I mean, you got to be 80 years old before you can start your life work, right? <laughs> <laughs> and there are many others mentioned in Hebrews 11. Of course, we know that the waiting time will come to an end 
with the second coming of Jesus. And what about those who've already died? For each one of them, the next moment in time that they're aware of is when they will see Jesus, either at the second coming or some at the third coming. Abraham was given that incredible challenge and promise at the age of 75. 25 years went by when it seemed like he was too old and he was given the promised child. Try to imagine the children of Israel living for more than 100 years to that Egyptian slavery and waiting for God to do something. Okay, Jim, I think we're back to you now. Waiting is made up of two variables. One is the anticipation of the fulfillment of the promise, and number two, the expectation that, that what is promised will be fulfilled within or by a certain time in life when we wait, we actively anticipate an event to come. Whether we wait, can we await a new job, an imminent wedding, the birth of a baby, the completion of an academic degree, an upcoming voyage, a new appointment, etc. A lapse of time must transpire between the anticipation of the event and, the, and its fulfillment. The same is true for God's promises to in daily life, as well as for the ultimate fulfillment of the great events in the plan of redemption from the Bible study guide. Okay, now we're going to dive into some Hebrew that um, we may not fully understand. I'm sure I don't. There are six Hebrew words used by the psalmist to describe uh, waiting or hoping. And it's in the from the teacher's, adult teacher's Sabbath school. The first Hebrew word for waiting or hoping is Kava, which means to wait for, to wait, or to expect. Okay, that seems pretty straightforward, right? This word is used 20 times in the Psalms. Each time it suggests that God is the one for whom we should wait. So now here we're talking about waiting specifically for what? For God. The word can also be used in a negative sense in, as in waiting for your enemies to conquer you. That's not so much fun. The second he word for waiting or hoping is yahal. Okay, Jennifer, you want to take on that one? In the Bible study guide. Yahal means, quote, to wait, hope, endure, long for. It is usually connected with kawa. In the book of Job, yahal is usually applied to hope that is futile or seems useless and is thus not connected to God. Now, who's discussing, who's using these words in the book of Job? Probably Eliphaz, probably. There's always a big argument back and forth, and between Job, probably some of it, some of it might be Job's words. Okay, go ahead. But such is not the case in the Psalter. God is the explicit object of the hope that is rendered from Yahal, as indicated in Psalm 31, 24. Quote, all you who hope in the Lord. Psalm 33, 22, quote, just as we hope in you. And Psalm 38, 15, quote, for in you, O Lord, I hope. Psalm 39, 7, quote, my hope is in you. Psalm 42, 11, hope in God. And Psalm 69, 3, quote, my eyes fail while I wait for my God. Our Creator is worthy of all our confidence. Our trust in His faithfulness and love is the foundation of all true religion and the basis of the relationship between God and humans. This relationship is based on His mercy and on His loving kindness, which He bestows upon those who trust in Him. <clears throat> From Psalms 33:18 and Psalms 147:11. Okay, so in other words, there's lots of things that the Psalms were waiting for and hoping for and, and really longing for. It appears to be that, that was a Job's in, in uh, chapter six of Job, the quotation. It, what, Job six is Job, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and 29 is Job also, I know for sure. I don't know about 14. Uh, it should be clear to all of us by now that it is in the pages of Scripture that we find the evidence for basing our trust and hope in God. So this is a hint of something that we need to always emphasize. Faith is based on what? Evidence. Evidence. Faith is based on evidence. So, um, 
Another Hebrew word for waiting is, and I don't even know how to pronounce this, haka. Gordon? That word, haka, or however you say it, means to wait, endure, expect, hope. I'm yep. going to interrupt for just a second. We've noticed we've come from just a simple waiting with our first word, but now these words are starting to include endure, expect, hope, okay? The object of Haka is usually God, and there are a bunch of references from the Teacher's Bible Study Guide. Okay. Living in our modern, secular, materialistic culture, we, we tend to put our faith in money, our abilities, our degrees, science, or even in our countries. We are thankful, some of us very thankful we live in a country where at least we're supposed to have complete freedom. As Christians, our trust should rest primarily in the Lord. And Psalm 33, 1 through 17, this Psalm says that God is ultimately in control of everything. And I, let's, let's read a few of those verses. All you that are righteous, shout for joy for what the Lord has done. Praise Him, all you that obey Him. Give thanks to the Lord with harps. Sing to Him with stringed instruments. Sing a new song to Him. Play the harp with skill and shout for joy. The words of the Lord are true and all His works are dependable. The Lord loves what is righteous and just. His, his constant love fills the earth. The Lord created the heavens by His command, the sun, moon, and stars by His spoken word. He gathered all the seas into one place. He shut up the ocean depths and storerooms. So it sounds like, I mean, the message of this psalm, obviously, is that God is controlled, pretty much in control, control of everything, isn't He? Psalm 106 is another place where it's a review of Israelite history. Psalm 105 and Psalm 106 both are based on, okay, what do we learn from this story? What do we learn from this story? And obviously we don't have time to go back and look at all those things. Perhaps the most telling portion of that Psalm is in verses 13 to 21. The stories of the gold bull calf. And what do we learn from the story of the gold bull calf? Frightening the children the lasted not very long. 40 days after God spoke to them from Mount Sinai, they're dancing drunk and naked around a gold bull calf, and they're claiming that that bull calf is Yahweh who brought, took them out of, brought them out of Egypt. That's scary. And also the story of the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. What happened there? They were sucked. Remember, these people decided Moses and Aaron didn't know how to lead us. We're going to find some people who will lead us where we want to go. No. And what happened to them? The earth opened up and swallowed them, right? Many times in the wilderness wanderings, the children of Israel turned away from God. Another Hebrew word associated with waiting and hoping is Duma. Okay. The Bible study guide says Duma is a noun that means silence, rest. It refers to the silence of death. That's pretty silent. Pretty silent. Yeah. Duma refers to the silence or rest that reflects trust in God or to the lack of silence that results from God's apparent inactivity. From a God new... Inactive? Inactivity? Well, in other words, you're, you're hoping and you're trusting and you're, when is God going to do, gonna do something? And you're just sitting there waiting yeah. for God to do something. Yet another Hebrew word is associated with waiting and hoping is sabar. Our Bible study guy says the verb sabar is used less often for hope in the Old Testament than the other words that we've considered thus far. Sabar conveys the idea to expect, hope, examine. What would examine, how would examine fit in there? The psalmist states with confidence, happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope, Saber, Sabar, is in the Lord his God. Trusting the Lord will bring happiness to the believers even in the midst of trials. We have studied about the reasons to trust God and to worship him. The core of these reasons <coughs> is hope. Psalm 145, verse 15, Jim. All living things look hopefully to you, and you give them food when they need it. 
Good News Bible. Okay, who supplies the food for the animals and for the birds? And Still another Hebrew word associated with waiting and hoping is hill. Jennifer? From the Bible Study Guide. The verb hill means, quote, to labor, writhe, tremble, and also to bring to labor or brought to birth. Thus, Psalm 37, 7 can be translated literally, quote, rest in Yahweh and travail, or bring forth in birth for him. The implication is that the long-suffering endurance we must have as we wait for God's promises to be fulfilled is like the anguish of an expectant mother ready to deliver her child. This period of suffering implies hard labor, intense pain, and tears. The result of the newborn baby, however, offsets the anticipation and experience of suffering. Hmm. In the same way, waiting for the Lord often involves temporary anguish and suffering, but the outcome will be rich in blessings from the Lord. So when that baby is handed to the mother, put on her chest there, maybe held up to the breast, and she says, all she can think about is the pain, right? <laughs> no, not at that moment. Okay, Psalm 37, 7. Be patient and wait for the Lord to act. Don't be worried about those who prosper or those who succeed in their evil plans. Good News Bible. Paul also, Paul also recognized that hope was a very important part of the Christian life. How do we know that? 1 Corinthians 13. What's 1 Corinthians 13 all about? The love chapter. The love chapter, right? And what does it say at the end of that chapter? Meanwhile, hmm? I'll go faith, hope, love. Yeah. Three. Meanwhile, these three, re, these three may remain: faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And our Bible study guide concludes: Hope motivates us to persevere in the face of sickness or tragedy. Hope is the fire that burns inside us, igniting the desire to grasp the power in God's promises. This flame is fed by the daily reading of and meditation upon the scriptures. Every trouble in our lives finds a solution in a specific gem of Bible truth. Assuredly, hope is the attribute that keeps our eyes turned toward heaven as we wait the second coming of Jesus. And I'm very happy to tell you our next quarter will be on the great controversy. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a blessing it is to have the hope that we do have, the hope that you will come again soon. May it be very soon, and may we be prepared is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.